Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Knocked Conscious. Today I had the pleasure of speaking with Brendan B. Brown of the band Weedus. It was a great conversation. Here it is. I hope you enjoy it. I just started recording and I'm going to clap. There you go. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, welcome to Knocked Conscious, Brendan. <laughs> Thanks for now, having me, man. Now I know it's Brendan B. Brown. Right. I, I saw you on an interview, something about Triple B doesn't sit right with you, but BB works because it's in your new song, right? Uh, I, you know, I don't really care. Uh, the band, they call me B. Um, uh, I've been called Triple B. Uh, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not fussy about that sort of thing. Excellent. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, I saw you in a picture with MJF, the current AEW champion. Did I see that you in the ring with him? Yeah, did you see a picture of me kicking his ass? I did see you with a boot yeah. in his face. What yeah. was nice about that, do you notice that he calls the belt the Triple B now? I don't know if you knew that. Well, I mean, it's because he knows I, 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 if he faces me again, he'll get another beat down. Like, then that'll be the third. So he's, you know, he said, what is it? A, what is it? A, a, a little token of, uh, is he his little voodoo charm? He's trying to keep me away. I mean, <laughs> was you know. it the, the third, you, you beat him twice. I beat him twice, man. I beat him at, uh, Joey Janelle's lost in New York. I stomped him there and I stomped him again at the clusterfuck, uh, the following April. He just keeps trying. And now he's like hiding on TV, you know, like, yeah, he is probably, hiding. He's hiding. Like got in security guards, like you know, <laughs> That's yeah. really awesome. So let's, I want to start off uh, early here. Let's, let's, uh, what's that called? Like meld well, our, our, first our of all, force. shout out to spider Nate Webb because that, that it would, that was, those were the matches both times. I mean, that's the rivalry. That's the real rivalry. You know, I mean, MJF can't get a leg up unless he cheats. And then I have to come in and like, you know, fix his ass. So, you know, use the ring this weekend. I watched yeah. it. Yeah. So <laughs> very nice. So uh, I saw you on Twitter. Something about name an innocuous thing on a hill that you're going to die on. And yeah. you, you mentioned Van Hagar. Yeah. You were born. My understanding is you were born October 13th of 19. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, I was born October 11th, 1973. Oh, 11th. I apologize. Yeah, that's I all got right. 13, 11 mixed up. Maybe that's why I didn't send it to you. Right. I don't know. That's OK. Maybe. That's okay. 13 <laughs> well, is the Taylor belated. Swift number. So, you know, I mean, we're, we're halfway there. Well, I'm end of September, so we're both Libra, but we're a year apart. There so you and I okay. basically grew up with all the same stuff. Right. Uh, I grew up in Philly, so, you know, we're both East Coast guys. Sweet. So what, what's really Philly. interesting. So much love for Philadelphia. Yeah, I saw you tweet some things about it, and that's what, that's what reminded me about this is on your 18th birthday, on the 15th of October, four days after your 18th birthday, Van Halen played in Philly, and I got to see it. And I've got my ticket and I gifted it to my friend, my best friend, but I got a ticket and uh, Matt Bruck, who's now the uh, CEO or the, the found, uh, the owner of uh, EVH, mm -hmm. Eddie Van Halen amps. Yeah. He was the roadie for Eddie Van Halen and he gave us the F-U-C-K guitar picks. Right. <laughs> full unlawful carnal knowledge guitar picks. Nice. So I have one of those with the uh, ticket. I'll send you a picture of it. But I just thought it was kind of funny because you said Van Hagar and I'm like, that concert was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um. So you saw fifty one fifty live, or you saw for unlawful carnal knowledge? That's the one you saw. I, I saw right. for unlawful carnal knowledge. I okay. did not see fifty one fifty. That's but. awesome. I so so if I could explain why I'd die on that hill, I didn't like uh, David Lee Roth that much. Now I've I've come to like him uh, as a person after the fact. I think he's really entertaining. He's a good writer. He's an EMT. He seems like an all around, like a pretty good guy, you know. Um, but uh, but the sort of like high kicking, like spandex front man was definitely not my thing. If I wanted a front man, I wanted Bon Scott or or Brian Johnson. Um, and if I didn't have a front man, if I had if I had to have a my preference would be for a front man who would play guitar as well or play an instrument because Rush was my favorite band. And I was like. I was like, there's no excuse for just standing there playing, singing your song unless you're like one of these guys who can sing something impossible. And, you know, Dave's a great vocalist, but he can't sing things that are impossible. He's got a nice high screech, uh, but we're not talking about Bon Scott here, you know. Um, and uh, I always got the feeling with Van Halen that there was something being held back, even on uh, my favorite Dave record, which is... Um, uh, 
Oh, the one with the guy with the head. Uh, it was got unchained on it. Um, uh, I don't know. Oh I, shit. Um, oh god. Fair warning. Even okay, even fair, fair warning. Even fair warning, which is my favorite. My favorite uh, pre Hagar record. Um, I just felt like something was something was missing, and in my opinion, it was the fact that. Eddie's not just a guitar player. Eddie's a an all around, you know, sort of virtuoso. He's got like put those keyboards piano on. Piano skills it. too. Yeah, he's got he's got arrangement skills. He got piano skills. He and his brother are the nastiest duo of rhythmic peculiarity in in heavy music ever. I mean, those guys play what's effectively, if you look at like Drop Dead Legs or anything like that, you're you're talking about jazz. Like they're playing jazz right. together. Right? Yeah. Um, I mean, look, I, I, I hate to be like cliche, but like the beginning of Hot for Teacher is just such a great intro. It's ridiculous, man. It's totally yeah. awesome. Um, but like I said, for my money, I would take something like the bridge to Drop Dead Legs or um, uh, the whole entire song, 5150, that, the title track, right? Um, right? I mean, that's Eddie spreading his wings. That's the real thing. And I feel like Sammy... Being able to play guitar so well and hold Sammy's like a triple threat, right? Sammy can write a song. Sammy can sing like, you know, any of the Bon Scots of the world. And Sammy can play guitar almost as good as Eddie, which is kind of weird, right? If you think about he it. He can rock but, it for sure, right? He definitely has the chops. He's yeah. great, man. I mean, and and when Sammy joined, I was like, all right, this is the band. This is the one that like got away from Eddie and Alex early on and poor Michael Anthony just kind of like, you know, holding down the high notes on the, on the harmonies the whole time. Um, arguably one of the greatest rock and roll bass players who ever lived. Um, um, probably underrated, probably one of the oh, most underrated for sure. So underrated. And Ted, you know, for my money, I don't think Ted Templeman ever put enough bass on those records. You know, it was like, they had this thing going at, I mean, I could go off on this forever. I'm not sure you want this to be the whole set po podcast, I but well, but, hey, look, we've got time. So if you if you're willing to share, I'm I'm willing to listen because you've got knowledge of things that you know you've got things inside of you that you could probably share with the world. Uh, so that so for my money, I think that I think that when Eddie moved everything to the, the 5150 studio and they got away from Ted's uh, bare bones approach, that's when it started to be really interesting. And I think that. 5150, OU812, for Norfolk Carnival. Those that triple set right there has the most interesting guitar, keyboard, drums arrangements on it. Now, does that mean that Van Halen with Dave wasn't great? No, man, it's classic 70s arena rock shit. Like that set the tone for there's no there's no Motley Crue without that. There's no, you know, you name it, uh poison, winger. Striper, Britney Fox, Kicks, like all of the cheese metal. Like, there's none of that happens. None of them. Right up to I mean, Warren. Rat, I remember Rat and Quiet Rat, Riot. Yeah, none of that happens without David yeah. Lee Roth proving everybody wrong about that kind of stuff, right? So I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stand here and shit talk. But, but as a person who is interested in more complex music, perhaps some progressive rock, at the same time that I love a great pop melody and an interesting pop arrangement, um. Which, by the way, I find in Ariana Grande songs and Taylor Swift songs, and like I keep finding that stuff. I I um I never stop being sort of marvelled by pop because pop can be very interesting. But it can be that rhythmic. There are some there are some like patterns that just drop pull you into the yeah, song. Man. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, and you know, I'm as influenced by pop music as I am by like you know the B side of hemispheres by rush you know like it's just, <laughs> right like, you pick the most obscure weird shit that nobody wants you to put on at the party i'm just as influenced by that as i am by like third eye blind second record you know so okay, um yeah. so i i feel both those things and i feel like the the one of the finest cross combos of those two powers in music the pop side and the progressive side was started at the end of uh, 1984 and then really bloomed on 5150 and OU812. I think that's yeah. that's that shit, you know. Um so 
yeah, Van Hagar for me, like 100%, that's when they hit their peak. Now, that's not because they sold the most records during that period. That has nothing to do with that. That's no, because it, it's sub- first of all, music is subjective. I mean, if you look objectively at a sales, come on, it's right. like boring. Like, who cares? Like, like, you know, right. I mean, lots of things that that can't that don't last, that don't stand the test of time have been very successful initially. You know, or like um, a lot of art, posthumously successful. Yeah, right? exactly. You know, the you know, Great like, Gatsby was not, you know, necessarily a hit in in F. Scott's like time. I mean, it was it was celebrated, but then it was like you know, it went away, it disappeared. Like, you know, he spent most of his life thinking that he didn't have a second novel in him, and it kind of he kind of didn't. You know, um, yeah. But but regardless, I think I think that um, I think that that the trajectory of Van Halen for me is much more about what they started doing once Eddie was free, once he had his own studio, once he had his own creative space, once he, once he could start being the producer in earnest, um, you know, and if you read anything about the diver down process, you realize that that's where he, that's the straw that broke his back where he was like, this sucks. I'm not doing covers anymore. There's like five or six covers right. on that record, you know? Right. Well, that was, that was my, that would be my criticism. And I hate to say it in a, in a negative way, but I was exactly what you loathe. I was a front man who didn't play an instrument, but of a cover band. So right. come on, man, talk about but, a loser, right? <laughs> no, but you're, and in some sense you're doing <laughs> but, the Lord's work, right? Because people, well, people don't you have to recognize the song. Right. So that's important. Right. right. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. I cut you off. No, it's fine. I mean, like, I, I, again, I don't want to stand here and be like, like my other favorite band is ACDC, right? Um, now that's music that almost literally cannot be played and sung at the same time, right? You're talking about Angus Young playing solos, Malcolm and Angus, if they're not in the solo section, they're playing these weird harmonic inversions of the same chord that are, you know, tricky as hell. Nobody's ever going to be able to peel that onion and figure out what they did on those records. But you listen to Back in Black, right? Back in Black, just the first 20 seconds of it is sounds like meat and potatoes rock, right? Yeah. Bullshit. Go ahead and try and do it right and make it sound like the record does or make it sound like they do it live. They are doing some tricky, weird, the bass is doing a harmony what, what, for, through one pass of the riff and then the guitar takes the harmony for the next pass of the riff and it feels like that song is bending the chord and it's power it's toward power right they're all everything in acdc is about impact yeah. and it's like your, driving right yeah. it's that yeah but they never they, they know how consistently rhythmically rhythmic they are so to, in order to not beat your ear down with the same exact pattern every time they're making these subtle changes that i think they really started doing when they met up with mutt lang around um the end of the power everybody Ridge. who meets up with mutt lang improves don't they right right you're talking about an ever an ever escalating exponential complexity to what they're doing in their layers are they simply recorded records yes they are are they simply arranged records no they're not and people who talk about acdc being simple or whatever is like you just don't understand you don't understand how hard okay. why then does nobody else sound that good if it's that right. easy, tell me, you know, right. there's nothing like it. No, nothing. nothing. I, I nothing. totally get it. Yeah. yeah. So, so on that note and, and to your point is like the David Lee Roth criticism. And once again, we're, we're not here shit, shitting on the guy. We're just no. constructively cr- saying, Hey, there were a lot of covers in the beginning and he loved yeah. doing that. And when he left them, he did covers on his own. Yeah, man. I mean, and they're cool. I love, and they're I'm, awesome. Yankee Rose isn't even a cover. And I love right. that song. And, you know? and there's three there's three ways I look at covers. You could try to do it on like an identical exact version, like Africa from Weezer, in my opinion. It's almost right. like an identical sound. No, for you no, can do yeah. one where it's like an alternate sound where it still sounds like it, like a reggae ska version of eight six seven five three zero nine. Right, right. Or you could make it sound so new age and so different but still have some core elements if you pay attention to it to pick it apart so there's many ways to do it and he just added flair to whatever he did yeah uh yeah you're you're pointing out something that nobody talks about there i'm glad because i loved i love that (laughs) yeah there's literally an there is without a doubt physically factual limitless possibility 
an infinity of versions of what you can do, right? But there's not that many right ones. There's not that many that it's hey. almost like it's almost like Earth being a planet that's in the Goldilocks zone that has life on it, right? How many yes. planets are out there? Trillions. There are so many planets out there you can't even count them, and they're all different. But there's only a handful of them that have life. And if there's right. only a handful of those, then there's only a handful of intelligent life. You know, it's like that. You start whittling it down. It's like, well, actually, that makes it really hard to do something like dancing in the streets the way that Dave did. Yes. Or I think just a gigolo. And right. it's just because because Louis Prima, who's just so much fun. I mean, that original is just such a great. And he and he really kind of modernized that song in a really odd way. But it still kept that purity of that that pop to it, you know, that Latin kind of flair yeah. that Prima Louis to. Louis Prima was my grandfather's favorite artist. Cool. And mostly because of the the little chat scat that he used to do in between come here, but come in, but like that kind of yep. stuff. Because he, he, yeah. he spoke, he spoke like my grandfather did. He sounded like that was a, they had the same voice, you know, they had the same New York like fast talk. Like yeah. get it, puppy. Get get up here, boy. Get it, puppy. You're like, come on, come on with that saxophone, boy. Like, like, and then you know, <laughs> making the guy play it between his legs. You right. know, the whole like, let's not fuck around. Let's fucking do. This is a yes. saxophone solo, goddammit. it. And Dave understands that as a front man for a band. He yes. never, he never came in half cocked. He was always an explosion. Right now. Performance is more than just musicality in some cases, right? Obviously, for sure. Um, Dave doesn't need to be able to play the piano and the guitar, like, like, right. you know, like Beethoven, you know, which is how I right. see, I see Eddie Van Halen, like he's Beethoven. Like oh, that's how abs I, absolutely yeah. there. Find right. someone to argue that, to be honest. I mean, I don't think anyone could actually argue that point. No, no, he's a per, he's a perfect example. And his son is it's just as good, like unbelievably talented people. I'm Jeez. so glad that that got passed down that like that way. Um, yeah, like true, true genius uh, um, and breakthrough style. Did you ever see the interview? Uh, it's not an interview. It was a performance that Eddie did for a, a Les Paul tribute. No, I never saw that one. You can look it up online. But yeah, basically, they're, yeah, they're in some kind of club and it's around the 5150 era, I think, maybe a little bit later. And it's a tribute to Les Paul. And Eddie's up there and he stops for a second. And he starts to talk about Les Paul's uh, develop the, the way he developed engineering of records, right? How, because Les Paul invented multi-track and he was the first one to stack tape heads on the, like the whole, and he, and for a long time, record companies didn't know how Les Paul was getting these sounds because he, he invented it and he had it in right. a studio. And that, that when, having read what Eddie did with the 5150 studio and finally getting to that place, that made that that pairing on that stage at that tribute made so much sense to me what he was saying. He's saying you had a laboratory where you not only wrote, but you reinvented the aesthetic by changing the formula for making it go to tape, right? For making it reco a recorded thing. And that's an engineering level that I think Eddie got to on 5150. I think that that happened. I think that record is is what I would like call like an impossible record. It cannot be made by anyone else under any other circumstances. There's you could have any number of infinite infinities of permutation and you'll never have that happen again. You know. So I'm just smiling because it's like watching the passion of music. It's like because what what had me reach out to you, what's interesting is I just want to close the loop on covers. Right. The reason I brought, I thought about that too, the David Lee Roth question, I thought it might've been a cover issue for you. Not a hundred percent, but to some extent, but, um, I you like did a covers. cover. Yeah. You did a cover. Those a little respect that replaced a, was it freak on, on the first album? Well, that's a really good question. Um, cause I watched you on an interview earlier in the summer or something. And I watched your face. I watched people's expressions. And when they brought a little respect and you brought it up, you gave a little stink face. And I'm curious if you had a little anim like just a thought, no. like just feedback about it. No, I didn't actually. Um, we had I a love lot that of song, by the way. That's a, that's a phenomenal cover. Thank you. We had a lot of covers in the first iteration of this band when we started playing live shows in '97 or so in New York City. 
We had Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. We had um, Cheap Tricks Surrender. We had Jesse's Girl uh, by Rick Springfield. When we were playing these songs um, as tight to the original as we possibly could, we wanted to show that we could be chameleon that way. Like, we can do Willie Nelson. We can do Robin Zander. We could do these things. And and, um, there was a certain pride in that. But the fact of the matter is that Erasure is too unique. I shouldn't say too unique. That's the wrong terminology. They're too idiosyncratic and too novel in their approach to synthesizer pop that they made it heavy, right? They made things yes. feel thumping. And prior yes. to that, those 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 um those Depeche Mode records, they're kind of good. They're kind of yeah, no, 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 no. Right. right. The personal but Jesus. Nothing, nothing hits as hard as like Chains of Love and A Little Respect. Those two songs, and there's um there's a few others too, that just pound. They pound like rock. And that's why it was easy for us to cover it, because the energy was already there in the in the arrangement, in the composition. So okay. it's kind of cheating a little bit, right? Because they had okay. already done such such magnificent work. Um and, you know, uh, just throwing a distortion pedal on instead of adding keyboard layers uh, is not as complicated or as challenging or as interesting, I think, as what the original did. Now, right. I know that people appreciate our cover on a level that's quite different from the original and that that's what kind of what you were talking about. Like you can hit that note where you're, it's your own and it's not it's not the original. Um, right, but it is an homage for sure. I mean, you know it's you know the song. Yours is more of a replication, not replication in a bad way, just a yeah, a noticeable cover or recognizable cover than Well, like, so the other thing is is that's the vocal on that song, right? Yeah. That's not that's not how I naturally sing. I have to do something a that's little falsetto? bit. That's falsetto? Yeah, I, well, no, I do sing falsettos, but the way that they crack from the te- mid mid-range tenors into the falsettos that's not something i typically do right yeah that's not it's almost like my, a yodel it it's is like very a, much a yodel um yeah and it's their own that own uh vince and andy sort of unique placement of the vocal uh in this ultra passionate and bare sort of way um and the vocal takes are always spot on at a, in an era when there was no auto-tune by the way like those notes are perfect so i had to do james laid I know right. exactly. Yeah, you that's know, another pretty. one. That's that. That's yeah, that's right. yeah. that's the one that pops into my head when you think of that. It's so pretty, hee, 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 right? Yeah, you get that. Yeah. Now you got a you got a chance there to accidentally show disrespect, because if you goof that or you try to make it sound like, you know, a wind up doll or some kind of like kitschy thing, you like disrespect. a air horn. Yeah, 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 like yeah, a, yeah. yeah, like a air sign. Yeah, you you can't disrespect. Their their approach to it because they they took a huge risk putting something out like that. Not to mention, you want to talk about like, you know, gender issues. Those motherfuckers walked out on stage during the Reagan administration with a pink g-string bikini, in uh, at Nas, at Madison Square Garden in Nassau Coliseum, in 1988, 89. You know, we're uh, talking like that was, for lack of a better bold. term balls right like bold, like you, yeah, bold, like yeah, balls bold talk yeah, about being it. brave like that's that's brave For sure and yeah so you're you're also you're you don't want to disrespect that movement that they were so out front on um and uh and you're also you're also talking about a group that was uh openly uh openly gay during an era where freddie mercury wasn't openly gay Right. You know, like you t- he had to hide. You know what I mean? And so Freddie like, Mercury was my he was my yeah. I don't know, just I bought a tape. I remember buying a tape at a flea market, Best of Queen, when I just started driving. You know, 1990, 1989. Yeah, twenty five cents at a flea market, and wore through that tape back and forth and back and forth. What listening to that show? He had it all. He could do it all too. Queen Queen is the thing. Like you're like you have Brian to go. May and, yeah, the songwriting and the really interesting sounding records and him being an astrophysicist and knowing how to place microphones and all that, that's all very interesting. But the chops that those guys have is yes. way more interesting. Energy. <laughs> I mean, cool. is it the best 20 minute set? Is it Live 8 set? I mean, it's got to be arguably yeah. one of the hand, best. Hand, no, hands. I mean, like, I, I'm even thinking about it getting chills. Chills. You could, 
you could Chills. you could refer to the to that as the greatest live performance that's been captured in modern history. I would call I, it that. Okay, I'll give it I'll, arguably other than the moon landing if it was real. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go there. Cool. Yeah. Well, so you just finished like a crazy tour where yeah, you went we through some ups and downs. You got you had some issues, this and that. Do you want to share a little some stories about your tour, how it went, and what's well, been going on in the UK? From the year 2001 until ni- 2019, we went back to the UK at least once a year. And the pandemic stopped that for four and a half years. So for us, that was like, man, there's something really missing here. Like that cornerstone of what we have been doing to perform, to be performers is gone for four and a half years. You can't atrophy like that. Now, we got real lucky because although we spent 2020 off the road, Art Alexakis and the guys in uh, uh, Living Color and Hoobastank, those three bands. Wait, Living Color? Yeah, Living Color. They took us out on the road um, for the summer. I hope to tour. talk with you after this. Then I hope we can connect because they're coming here in February, and I'd love to talk to Vernon and, and oh, Corey. Oh man, that's a they that's are. A, I grew up listening to to Living Color. That first album was absolutely amazing. Yeah, it's it's miracle shit. They they and Corey Glover's first solo album too. Just to be clear, so I don't know if you've seen them live lately. I have not. You're talking about. Every night we watched the whole thing. Had we heard the songs a million times? Yeah. Do they ever play them the same way? Nope. Welcome to school, kids. Like that was like we were front and center for the greatest improvisational pop, heavy metal, rock, jazz lessons that you can get, you know, and we were able to watch. So we did. And we. I, I remember the first night wondering, like, I haven't seen them live for a while. I wonder what, wonder what it's like, you know? And Jesus, I was instantly filled with two feelings. First of all, gratitude. And then inadequacy. <laughs> and then complete and utter inadequacy of, like, <laughs> what am I even doing here? This is like, you know. But, uh, I mean, uh, I read, I'm sorry, I read a single Vernon Reed tweet and my head explodes. He's a walking I'm encyclopedia. Of... Watching him dissect any kind of song. <laughs> this song of the day. I mean, it's... And, and he's the best conversationalist in the world. The rest of the tour, they, they were, we broke down into two groups, right? Uh, my, my, our bass player and drummer would come by and see me and Vernon and my partner Gabrielle talking and go, oh, it's the heavy talkers again. Because we were was straight into none of this small talk shit just right into like important political racial you know geopolitical like everything just a whole there's nothing we didn't talk about and just i had cause can't stress this enough the education level the privilege of that education proximity was profound man it was like I'll never I'll probably never get to learn that much from a single person ever again. And then watching them play, uh uh I, I can't even describe it. It's like I, I'm looking forward to it. i I know they're coming here in February, so and I'm yeah. in Phoenix. So when you come out to Phoenix, you'll have to reach out. We'll have to yeah, have to get yeah definitely, definitely. I would if I if you have the opportunity to buy more than one show's worth of tickets, that's the way to do it. Why? Because because he's not, different every time. It's not going to be the same. Yeah. So you're going to get like a different. I'll see if he's in Vegas too. They might only do one in Phoenix because Phoenix isn't. Right. We're okay. We're not. And I was, you know. I was around. I was backstage. I was eavesdropping. I never heard them talk about what they were going to do. I never heard them discussing what <laughs> they, they were going to do. It. And I was trying to catch it, man. I was like, what the fuck are they going to do tonight, man? How, do, how the hell are they playing open letter to a landlord this different oh. from the way they did last night. And it's like they've done this, like they've rehearsed it like this. And I know they haven't. I know right. they have not, you know. like I love just, Open Letter. That's a great one. Salsa U is the one that just like all the weight lifts off my shoulders. I hear that it, little intro of the guitar. Yeah. The little that, tingling. And it's like, dun, it's dun, so dun. pretty. It's so pretty. It's and, beautiful. And just be, I, that's a good way to describe the, little, the music. It's beautiful. The, yes. There's but beauty. it's beautiful in its power and it's... 
and and yeah so hopefully i i hope i can reach out to you and we can connect that because i would love to have them over and break bread and, and have a conversation like this so i'll i'll, um, I'll try i'll i'll try my best i know those guys I, are busy these days but I'll i know they are best. but oh maybe if yeah. the, when they're in town is my point you know hell yeah <laughs> but um yeah, geopolitically, I was I looked at a lot of your stuff geopolitically. You're welcome to share that. I think you and I might have some differences, but I'm very much of a be you. You know, don't bother anyone else as long as you can be you. Yeah. But I do think there's a stodginess of that side that is part of the responsibility that becomes like, ur, ur, you know? You know, my my grandmother was a depression era baby, right? And she was a devout Catholic. Um and I always boil it down to she had her faith and she had her principles, but she also knew that you got to mind your own business, right? We have lost that. We have yes. lost touch with that. Thank we you. In, we are in other people's business talking about their crotches, talking about their identities. <laughs> this is not up for discussion with her. She was like, don't you ever talk about people that way? She with abortion, right? She would say, well, I think it's a sin, but that's not a man's decision to make for a woman. Like, you know, it was like, mind your business. Right. right. And I think, right. I think 90% of the, of the venom of our current political discourse that so many powers that be are really benefiting from our divisive conversation is so they want us. They, they want love us it. to be bickering about trans and about they want us other they want us in and, each other's business. Right. They want us looking what? under each other's hoods, right? And that is not American. They're not American. looking under their hoods. Right. So we won't look at their shit. And that's not American. It's not American to mind everybody else's business. It ain't. So, you know, I feel like we could we don't have to have a political conversation. We could just agree that we need to mind each other's business. business you know what? I, that, but that's the point is then we can have an actually open conversation about things because we we truly agree that regardless of what we feel, we're not here to impose our will on another, you know? Right. And we're not that different. Right. We're oh, not that different. We're like 99 percent similar. We're not that different. <laughs> we're so, we're genetically almost identical to chimpanzees, and it's like one, how like one percent different. We're shitting in our hands, Brandon. Come I on. I know, I know. This is my point. <laughs> like, how different can humans be from one another, right? If you just stop and think for a second about like, and then there is divergence, diversity too, right? It's like crazy how much the range is and how similar we are too. It's like both. Why do you, what what's the best thing about America, right? The best thing about this place, ostensibly at least. Is that you can come here from anywhere else, start your start your shit over, get a new identity, leave. And in the, in the ninth in the twentieth century, this was really important, especially to my grandmother who was the child of immigrants, that you leave the old world behind. Right. Yes. My my grandmother's mother was an Austrian Jew who was disowned because she eloped with a Sicilian uh, mason. Right. This is this was back then. In that country, in those countries, you couldn't do that. That was excommunicatable, right? right? But we don't fuck around with that kind of bullshit. Why? Because it's not efficient. Right. What if the Mason from Sicily learned something valuable from the Austrian Jew and they go mm -hmm. make a business together, right? What if, right? And all of these prejudices, they preclude the uh, possible hybrid that's better. Yes. Right? Like who could so see... Who could see in 1984 when Jump was on the top of the charts that that was the time to get rid of Dave? Right. 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 Nobody. Well, could see. I heard the story behind that, that kind of Eddie was holding it hostage a little bit because he had recorded all the masters in his studio and then threatened to burn them. Did you for, hear that for story? For 1984? For 84, for Jump. That's the whole point of where Jump, part of Jump came out that way where allegedly David Lee Roth was like, about jumping, like jumping off a building, like might as well jump. And he made it like a double entendre because they were in a big scuffle about it, allegedly. Really? That's that's, that's what I saw. I'll send you some literature. I don't want to get bogged down because if no. I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I thought I was watching this thing and it, that's what the thing was. Eddie was like, I'll burn them all. I'll burn it all to the ground unless you do it my way. Because he had that that sold that beginning of of jump and he, right. he couldn't get it out of his head. And he 1984, had, the, right. the, the title track. Yeah, it, right. Yeah, exactly. So he just could not get that all out of his head. And that was he had allegedly held a hostage. But it's a really amazing story, though. I mean, I can't fault him. I can't fault him. No. I still listen to that. I have I have several copies of 1984 on vinyl and I listen to it sometimes. 
And I sit there and I go, this was a really interesting choice to start the record that followed a record full of covers with this sort of almost Stanley Kubrick style magnum opus overture, right? right? But what it says is, and this was the most important thing I think Eddie was trying to say, you don't know Van Halen. You think you know Van You don't know shit. Get ready for this. And that was the jumping off point, for lack of a better term. For, right, uh, absolutely. For, for the rest of what they were capable of. So I'm, yeah. I don't care what he held on hostage under the bed with the tapes. I don't yeah. give a shit. You know, no, it, was all all. All right. it was all yeah. right. Well, that's the thing. And so to your point, I'm a first generation American. Right. So my, my parents are both German. Right. I had a grandfather who was a Nazi soldier. Right. That don't, became that, East Germany, became communist. They escaped East Germany. I mean, it's a crazy story that I'm here. My parents both met here that I'm here is like crazy. It's crazy. I don't even know how. But my parents, when they had us, my brother, had, you know, my brother and myself, they wanted to Americanize us as much as possible and integrate us because they chose America. Right. When they chose America, they still had a community of Germans, but they chose to move forward within the American experiment. Well, you, you know, got Americanized names. You, you know? know what's fascinating to me about that? They knew what Germany was. They knew what old Europe was with the alliances and the history of World War One and then how it led to World War Two, the Treaty of Versailles. They knew what they were leaving. They didn't necessarily know what they were coming to because what is America really? Can you describe it to somebody who's coming out of when there's no internet and there's barely any radio, somebody who's coming out of the 1940s coming to America from from you know from there? I don't think it can be described. And you have to realize that whatever they were leaving was bad enough to not need a full explanation of where they were headed. Think about right. that. Think about that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, they, like we're talking about went from Nazi to communism to West German to America. Yeah. I mean, you can't go through greater ideological shifts than those four different types of ideologies, right? You now. know, I think I, I have a degree in history. And I've always felt like the real question to ask people if they want to get the last 200 years of history right, right? Ask them why the first world war happened, not the second. We know why the second one happened. Ask them why the first one happened. Can anybody you know give you a succinct, detailed explanation of why the first world war happened? And don't tell me some brat nephew got assassinated in, in Czechoslovakia. Don't tell me that. Yugoslavia. Don't tell me that. I can take. I enough. can take on that challenge, Brendan. I just. Okay. I. I swear to God. Last month, I had a. I had a. An hour conversation with Scott Horton of Antiwar.com. Right. So if you know who Scott Horton is, he's kind of speaks out against the current stuff going on in Israel, and he's an. You know, he's a libertarian anti-war guy. Yeah. Um. But yeah, he he speaks to what led up to that, and then obviously how that then led into two. But yeah. you're right. Yeah, share yeah. with us. Hey, yeah. share, yeah. share with it's us. It's real what, simple. What you had a bunch of aristocratic families who had allegiances with one another that the common folk didn't know about. They had signed all these pacts with one another that if anything happened, they would come to each other's aid this way. Well, you think the farmer dying. Sounds like trend, NATO, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> to some degree. <laughs> well, to how, about, to how about a post post Soviet NATO? I would say I would say that I would say that the new model specifically avoids this old model because they know no one's going to fall for it again because okay. you had the emergence of trade unions and and sort of workers movements and farmers movements after world war one was so extremely powerful that we had the red scare we actually had emma goldman's deported and like all this shit you know so so what i'm talking about is there's no french farmer who died in the trenches in World War I, who knew why he was dying. Not right. one of them knew what they were fighting for. They didn't understand. They just knew that their aristocratic overlords had told them, get in the trench. Right. Yeah, that's mustard gas. We don't know what that is yet. You know, like, so anytime you have, if it's, if it's an ungoverned, if it's not a part of the government and it's still an extra governmental power, like an unregulated industry, I don't think Elon Musk is answering to anybody right now. I think he just does what he wants. 
And how, how could you, though? He's literally doing things we don't even know what's going on. This is the problem. Why does he have Starlink contracts with the with the American government? Why am I why are my taxpayer dollars going to his rockets that I've seen? I saw the Saturn V go up. I saw those missions successful. That was 50 years ago. My government yeah. already did spent that money in my name. What are we doing right now? What are we doing with those rockets right now? You know, I mean. I love technology. I am a technologist. If you told me I, I can't have tell my from all the shit behind you. <laughs> yeah, right. If you told me I could have my guitar rig in a little thing. So what I'm the parallel I'm drawing is French farmers, Belgian farmers in, in 1915, they had no idea why they were being sent to the trenches because their overlords had deals with each other that the voting populace, if there ever was such a thing, didn't actually know about. They had agreed to things that they didn't know that they were on the hook for. And the banks tried that with us in 2007. You guys agreed to shit that you don't know you're on the hook for, right? Yeah. There's any time you get into a situation like that where there are allegiances and pacts and contracts that we're going to underwrite that we don't know about, that's the problem. That's what that's why people wind up fighting each other and not knowing why. That's World War 1. Yeah. That's what it is. I mean, it's, it, yeah, chain, uh, I think, was it Chamberlain? He was kind of a mess. Neville Chamberlain? He was kind he of was, a mess. He was, in the lead up to World War II, he was the, the appeaser in, in Oh, England. that's right. Yes, the appeaser. There's interesting Sometimes. information about that that's pretty fascinating, though, about how he did actually know, but he wasn't in the position politically that Churchill would eventually be in, and he knew it and had conferred with Churchill about, okay, well, I'll carry this on. The British are brilliant at chess you know the the way that they their intelligence services has always operated over the years but i'd be fascinated no one will ever know really there's no way to ever look under that hood but uh I, well the do churchill I think, was able to resurrect his career and i hate to say resurrect his career but he had that first battle in world war one that cost like 50 to seventy thousand lives and that one straight where he's like we just got to do it and yeah, he well, just they threw all those men at it. They weren't prepared. The whole right, the whole and they weren't right. Was and dis- disarmed, you know. I mean, uh, right, right. And um, but th- that he was able to. Co- I mean, that he came back from that. That was just such right. a political, just horrible. Yeah, I want. I wonder if. I wonder if the British had any other alternatives. Well, he was a phenomenal wartime president or wartime leader. Prime minister. He just yeah, was, yeah. look how bad he was in peace. I mean, it's like he was perfect for war, but bad in peace. You know. Right. Right. I, what's yeah. interesting to me more so than that is I hate to say perfect, is, by the way. Th- th- Sorry. Yeah, right. No, this this is one of the things we do as a society. Like we bl- we blame the victim a little bit like England didn't start World War Two. Right. And everybody watched for nearly a decade while Hitler built a war machine and became this like overt racist lunatic who was threatening his neighbors from the get go, you know, sarcastically threatening his neighbors. Um Everybody watched. Everybody thought, oh, he'll calm down or he'll he'll lose an election or something. Uh, fascists, to- true totalitarians don't lose elections. They don't have elections. Once they're in, they do everything they can. It's the same. It's the same equivalent. Like if we give the profit motive to banks it's where it's completely unregulated and they make profits off of being underwritten. What, they're not going to hire people with those profits. They're not going to hire advisors to keep them out of trouble to make better bets. They're going to go to Congress with that money, and they're going to pay off Congress for laws that let them take more gambling risk. Right. That's exactly what they're doing. Like they, well, it's why? Fu- <laughs> Duh. It's I mean, funny. We're looking at government regulation, and it's like certain government regulations necessary. And then you're like, well, wait, the ones that are paying off the politicians are already in the business. So, like, yeah. for example, the Googles and the, you know, the X's and the whatevers, they're already in the social media realm. They're trying to regulate so no one else can get in at that point. They're trying to put up a wall now. If I could have, like, if I could have fly on the wall recordings of anything, it would be the conversations in the late 90s, starting with the think tanks and leading towards uh, the uh, Graham Leach Bliley Act, where Bill Clinton and, and uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Graham, I forget his first name. Is it Phil Graham? Billy Graham? Uh, no, I think Phil oh, Philip okay. Graham, <laughs> uh, a senator. Graham's they repealed Glass Steagall, which was mm-hmm. the law from the Roosevelt era that separated commercial banking from 
private bank, you know, um, so that the banks couldn't gamble with your mortgage right. and sell it to 14 other banks. Right. We merged and then with the Freddie May, Fannie Mae. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so we, we can why, do that. why I would love to hear why they thought they didn't need Glass Steagall anymore. Who the hell was that? Like, I, I know what it was. They saw Russian the, the finance. The people who paid for the foundation, who made yeah, donations that, to the foundation. Exactly. That's... But what they saw, I think, was they saw Russian finance finally let out of the cage, right? So yeah. you couldn't do business in Russia for 70 years, and suddenly they're doing business all over the globe, and it's totally unregulated because it's a it's a you know kleptocracy. So right. we need. they thought, we need to compete with that. Let's repeal Glass-Steagall. <laughs> like, <laughs> you idiot. Yeah, it's... <laughs> you know, it's this is the thing. It's like we because it's like the the terms are so short and it's not like I'm asking for longer terms because it's like a conundrum. Right. Do we want a leader for 20 years or do we want four no. year changes? Right. But with four year changes comes we're going to go 90 degrees left. And then in four years, we're going to jerk the wheel 90 degrees right. And then we're going to jerk it 90 degrees left. And then we're going to. And what when when we when we had to convince the Southern states to help us consolidate the revolutionary war debt, we got ourselves into trouble, right? The compromise where we moved the capital to the South and Jefferson thought he got what he wanted, but really Hamilton got what he wanted with the Northern industrial capitals that would eventually win the civil war was not the compromise they thought it was because the representation is now such that we have this electoral college mess where these states like Wyoming, where nobody lives, are kind of calling the shots for how big cities are subsidizing their roads and their sewers, right? right. We have Idaho, which is, I'm sure, a wonderful place. But do you know how much it costs to keep interstate infrastructure in the state of Idaho, considering there's not enough tax base there to support it in the first place? A business. I can only decision. imagine yeah. just all of the costs that we have. Right. It's incredible what you and I as city dwellers or maybe even big town dwellers have had to pay to subsidize these places. And I've been to them. I've driven past an exit in Wyoming that says Bradford population two. And the exit is the dude's driveway. You know, like did you have a show there? <laughs> he got an inner you no, know, right? I probably he he got he got That's an nice interstate thing. highway sign for his address. That's that's gratuitous. Yeah, it's a state Route 45, you know, right. like whatever mile right. marker 16, right? So, and and you know, nobody wants to admit this, but the the business decision is to give Wyoming back to the Native Americans. That's the good business decision because we're just subsidizing this piece of land where nobody lives, you know, and it's like yeah. Oh, man. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, so everybody does knee-jerk reactions. No one's looking three steps ahead. It's like, if we push this in, won't that pop out over here? Of like, course it will. Okay, so so that's going to pop out over here. So how do we resolve that next thing that pops out over here so that what that what's the result of this going to do when you push that in? We just go to the next thing. And it's yeah. like, we're so myopic, unfortunately. In yeah, way. and it's like, hey, we're squirting out uh, of the sides here. And we've been exactly. squirting out of the sides for a while. Are we yeah, ever going to stop and fix this? Like, you know, <laughs> it'd be nice. All yeah. right. Let's talk about something fun. Sure. What happened? What's going on with this? I just saw a repost of a Rolling Stone article with, was it Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey and their favorite song? Is this? Uh, we don't know that it's their favorite song. The, the tabloids. And I'll, I'll take that with a grain. So first of all, I should. I should preface this by saying I think that people talk about Taylor Swift in a way that they should shut the fuck up. <laughs> All right. Yes. Your girl saved the music industry by herself. She created more value in the touring and record streaming businesses. And, and then made more money for Ticketmaster, have... by the way. I'm gonna, I've got an opponent to pick with them, but whatever. Yeah, everybody yeah. does. But we're talking yeah. about one lady here who has managed to flip the script on the overseers and the gatekeepers and turn it into whatever she says they'll do. That's unheard of in the history of music. Beyonce is another one who has done a similar piece of work, right? You've got yeah, but, but in a crossover realm, too, because I don't even think the numbers are the same. I think that they I as think huge that as Beyonce is. 
yeah, maybe I globally, think, maybe internationally. I think but. they're comparable in terms of their impact on on just straight up Culture. like we were talking sure. about the music industry being dead 15 years ago and it was over and it's blah blah blah. These two people have single handedly rescued the whole entire operation, right? Right. And they've done it artistically, originally. Um, they have wrestled control back from people who had never ceded an inch of control to artists ever. So they rewrote the landscape, those two. And, um, yeah, you've got Springsteen and you've got a few male pop artists, but you've got to stop and say, nobody's done what these two have done. Nobody has done that. It's novel. It's incredible. And it's saved the whole entire business. And when you're talking about music industry, if you're talking about a, a stadium show like Beyonce or, or Taylor Swift are going to do, you're talking about thousands of truck drivers. You're talking about concessions people. Like right. you don't want to know how many people stay home and don't get a paycheck when they cancel one of those. I heard the number of the generated, the revenue generated, and it was astonishing. I don't even remember the number, but it was it, ridiculous. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's like, you know, I saw a figure the other day that Disney holds down only 5% of the Florida economy. But then I did a little digger, digging a little deeper, and it was like, that's, you're talking about the immediate employees. But hold on. No, there's Remove a trickle. There's a hotels and reservations, flight and attendants, truck drivers, right. concession people, food people. It's like you're talking about subtracting 25 percent of the state GDP if you get rid of Disney. It's right? bad. And yeah, so or, I think Taylor impactful. and Beyonce are like that, a c comparable yeah. in the music industry, maybe even more. So um, that's I'll say first. And the, uh, the, the way that they talk about her personal life is just just way overboard like you, you oh, know do they, yeah i don't i'm gonna be honest i don't listen too much to the person i know who who the fuck in their right mind would right because it's like hey. what are you talking about somebody like this like who, i was just trying know. to figure out a name for them i think it's right. swellsy or swellsy. no 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 <laughs> yeah, I, I, that, I don't that's whatever i don't care. i don't mind but you know there's been a lot of talk about. but anyway so back to the fun shit she and her apparently new new relationship guy i don't know his name i don't know a lot about football i'd be lying if i said i did um his name is Travis Kelsey, and I'm happy okay. to share that with you. But I also Travis know Kelsey. less, don't know that much about football either. So. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> so we're on the same team, I guess. Um, but uh, they uh, got drunk and sang Teenage Dirtbag around a fire pit somewhere. And he relayed that story as part of their uh, arc of their relationship. Now, that news story broke on Us magazine and, and the Daily Mail today. And I saw it because they put teenage dirtbag in the headlines so it's like you know shooting at me from all angles right yeah how can you um not? totally honored uh if it's true fantastic you know huge if true as they say <laughs> i am going to start a bonfire in my backyard and i'm going to invite the three of you to come over personally and uh sing it and we'll do it together i will say this publicly Probably. if it is true and you guys do want to have a party Engagement party, wedding, birthday party, bar mitzvah, whatever. We're available. That's all I'm going to say. I think we just broke news. I think we just <laughs> broke some headline news. So on on that, Teenage Dirtbag is obviously this thing. It is its own entity at this point, right? I mean, it's it's bigger than everyone combined. Um. I've seen two sides of the people who have something that impactful that happens to shadow over much of the rest of them. Cause it's just so big. I mean, it's so big, right? Like, yeah, it's ridiculous. And obviously with the social media and the current stuff with the TikTok stuff, was it 2 billion shares of some, some, some it's craziness? up there. I stopped uh, counting uh, when I realized I didn't understand the numbers, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's doing it's still doing a lot of work for itself um and we are so lucky uh and there's there's only sort of one sort of real reason that we're very lucky uh had teenage dirtbag come from uh like an a and r guy or a manager telling me how to write a song or a suggestion from somebody that was not exactly what i was feeling in my heart 
if it came from a place of trying to protect an existing career as opposed to like not really caring if you have one or not, just trying to get out what's inside, then I think we would probably feel a little bit of a burden around its renewable resource, you know, because it's, it's just, more of a commercial then entity than a, than a personal entity. Yeah, but but the fact of the matter is and no degree of commercial success or obscurity. Because if you're talking about Teenage Turbo, you have to talk about the years nobody really knew about it after it came out. Um, either one of those, neither extreme has ever made me feel regretful. And the only reason is because I wrote it alone. It came directly from me and my feelings about what it was like to grow up where I grew up in 1984, about the process of finding a musical identity in that environment and about uh, what it meant to be about to become an adult and face the consequences of your life having not conformed to whatever was being pushed back in the day, right? So here you I'm are. very familiar. Like I said, East Coast grew up same thing. When when I saw Dirtbag, it's like I knew what Dirtbag was. It's kind of like there was a there were a lot of colloquialisms, right? Like back east, we called out of of work. I don't know if you called out or called in. Yeah, you call. You can call out. Yeah. Yeah, we called out, but but out here, like ninety percent of the country calls in. And I remember a conversation where like, hey, Joe called in. I'm like, what do you have to say? And like, you won't be <laughs> in today. And it starts like, you know what I'm saying? So like, Dirtbag <laughs> to me meant exactly I think how you were depicting it. But it's hard to explain it if you had like it's like a lived experience almost. Right. So so when I was writing the song, I did I knew I knew where I was coming from with the uh, history of, you know, the murder and uh, uh, there being a satanic panic. I was like I, I grew up like in the epicenter, the ground zero of this American satanic panic movement. And um, I remember thinking. There's a way, it has to be a way to infuse this narrative with that danger and that information without making it a historical piece or referencing the murder directly uh, and making it sort of lovable still, fictional as it is. You know, I went to a boys Catholic high school right. that was an hour yeah. and a half away from my house. I didn't have a Noel or any of that. So um, yeah. it was a fantasy on some important level. and. Uh, when I was finished with it, I felt like that was that was what made me happy about it is that the danger was there, but the ugliness wasn't, you know, right. like the the hint of the hint of something darker was maybe present, but yeah, um uh, so it, we got really lucky. We got really lucky with a song that made sense. It still makes sense to me is a bit of a challenge to play live because you got to pay attention to how the, whenever we have a new drummer, that's the one that takes the longest. I mean, we have some tricky progressive rock drum arrangements in our catalog. Yeah, I can but, I can imagine that for sure. But, yeah. But the one that everyone gets stuck on is Dirtbag because we beat science that shit for four years before we had a drummer play it. We were working on a hip hop uh, workstation called an MPC 2000. Right. And I know those. Yeah. We were moving snare drums and, and hi hats like this until we felt that perfect Motown hip hop. ACDC Phil Rudd Nexus, right? Where it's like, it made me feel like all those things at the same time. And then when the chorus comes in, it has to be like Metallica just joined the band kind of thing. But <laughs> but Metallica with Dinosaur Jr., you know? Um, <laughs> Dinosaur Jr. reference. Look at yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. That was Beautiful. the shit that I was, that was guitar wise, I was trying to find the spot between like, and Justice for All and, and uh, Start Chopping by Dinosaur Jr., those two. Right. It was like, that's guitar. That's the guitar that it needs, you know? Um, bursting, absolutely bursting, like incapable of having any more tube saturation, you know? Um, it was, it's awesome. And it's great. It's, and it's funny. Cause I, I always think about that. I, I, I remember Edwin McCain talking about it. He did, I'll be right. Right. One of those solo hits. It just outshines everything else he could possibly do. Sure. And he's like, you could look at it two ways, right? You could have that resentment of that. Uh, Amy Winehouse did not like allegedly repeating the same songs she liked that jazz free flow style to your point sure. that living color being different every time that she had to do rehab every night like literally killed her in, in yeah. a weird way you know yeah so you could do it this way right but the you know the the slave to your success or you can look at the way you've looked at it and like it's like the lottery ticket that goes 
who complains about looking at their lottery ticket, man, this thing got me to do the rest of my life. And I love the way you have this way of looking at it from a gift and a blessing sense, not a burden sense. And that's one of the things that I wanted to, to touch with you about. How do you, how do you see the world that way? Or how, is it just, well, the way you- first of all, it's, e- it's easier. It's easy for me to talk like this because I wrote that song. And it didn't come from anywhere else. And I still feel that identity. And I still feel like that was part of who I was and remain. Right. Um, And I think a lot of other bands success in the music industry is weird. It's loaded with compromises. You wind up in a situation that's out of your control. And lo and behold, your big hit doesn't sound anything like the rest of your catalog. It's not a song you wrote. It's a compromised idea. It's a you don't feel it every night. Right. I feel teenage start back every night. I feel it t- teenage start back when I wake up in the morning because it's just me. It's just me alone, raw, unfiltered. You know, uh, I, am I a different person now and see the world differently? Hell yeah. But but I'm not I don't feel the need to be dishonest to that person who's 19 years old working on that riff, you know. Right. Um, and I have a lot of affection for that period of my life as hard as it was uh if for no other reason then i found my voice during that yeah. time on that song sure. and and you know going back a few more years when i was nine years old and ten years old i remember watching angus young the couple of tiny little times i was able to record him on mtv you know uh on a vhs tape little snippets i still have of the flick of the switch video and a couple a couple other things um and uh and the the maximum overdrive soundtrack when that movie came out like oh like, my gosh like, you maximum know all that stuff. Overdrive. and and that was when that was when i was i thought to myself that is so amazing what he does is so amazing if i can grow up and have any version of that i'm taking it right that's a win that's a successful life and obviously life and gets way more complicated than that than when you're 10 but uh i do actually have some version of that and that song um and the guitar technique within it and the vocal within it and the narrative within it all of which came from listening to metallica and listening to rush and prince and acdc and huey lewis in the news all that 1980s period of wanting to be involved in that and not knowing the first thing about how that's all real for me now so complain? I don't know. <laughs> Seems pretty <laughs> unrealistic to complain. I right. was well, I'll be working in a deli otherwise, which isn't that bad. I've done stuff like that. I worked in fish right. market and like all, you know. Um, but I'm saying that like I every every it's all year relative, I go, right? Yeah, uh, it's all relative. I go on the road with my band and it's a, you know, it's a lot of hard work. We do our own loading, we do our own merch, we do our own everything, you know. We do our own tech. Um, we set up our own stage. We have like one stage tech sometimes when we can afford it, but most of the time it's just us, you know, and I love doing that work because I know I get to play that song for people and they're going to give it back to me. You know, they're going to get something out of it. And so am I, and, uh, that's a a sacred, uh, gift. And I'm not going to, for one second, feel like anything went wrong there. You know, no, not at all. And I and actually, I think there's almost like a new generation, not just re, the replaying of yours, the re-recording of yours, which I'd like to get to right next. But sure. Uh, Jax, for example, does a female. Version of the of your character. Right? Love it. Like, yeah, she she interpolated. And she came, I that. saw you come out on stage one time with her. I don't know how many times you're able to do that, but that. Yeah, a couple, that couple times, uh, a couple times I had the honor of walking out on stage with her. She you know she's. She's different from us. She's in the pop world. Yeah. And she's got that that, con- that confidence, that that certain confidence of like, you know, no one can fuck with her, right? She's now, got a light, like a yeah, it's an air of lightness. It's like I'm good, I'm untouchable, but not in a not in an overt like snooty way. It's I'll tell it's you just, what, man. It, uh, I've 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 seen it up close. It's simply skill confidence. She can sing her fucking ass off, and she can write a dope song, and she's got. Uh, multiple instrumental skills and she's just great so she's and great that, yeah she's just great and that's what it comes from um i think her song victoria's secret is like a uh gonna be a classic one day like it's really gonna come back around and people are gonna be you know like holy shit this this girl wrote this song 
right that hits so many important notes you know like this is like mm-hmm. real shit um so she's a, a pop star of substance and of absolutely means. she's growing i think she just got married too so congratulations yeah yeah she did i was she invited me to the wedding but i couldn't go oh did she on, yeah i was on the road <laughs> i feel bad Jax. i hope i hope oh, it was wonderful awful. but well, congratulations Jax. maybe you yeah come on, yeah get them all together yeah so cool yeah so um, you had to re-record it yeah um what, i'd love to hear the story behind it obviously the second album hand over your loved ones was retitled to something right. i'd love to hear the story behind obviously how that all plays into itself with that and then the story i heard there was actually a little story behind how you got to the second title as well so the 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 first album seems to be lost i'll just say that the the, the multi-tracks for it um right. lost right the tapes that i delivered uh i delivered with a note that said please transfer to pro tools logic or tape immediately because they were a transitional format from the mid 90s to the early 2000s that only lasted about six or eight years and the, they were moved on from that recording format so um i sent five copies of those transitional style tapes by the way you couldn't tell that it was transitional at the time it, it later became obvious that that was a transitional digital format when pro tools right. took over it had taken over and then and then yeah it just didn't, didn't keep up with nobody the knew that right. that was going to be the case but i i knew that they needed to be backed up to some other format but anyway over the years uh we would get requests for licensing that required multi-track or instrumental or some alteration of the original parts of of the song and uh lo and behold somehow those licenses never happened and i began to suspect that it was because they didn't have them anymore or they had lost them so uh the the discussion of re-recording them just for no other reason than to make ourselves whole on that work that we had spent so much time on at my mom's house uh was begun in 2007 a couple of false starts um and I came to realize that I wasn't going to be able to do this unless I had some vestige of the original recording so I could get my head around how fast were these songs, what's the tempo, you know. Because, mind you, the CD is not the same tempo or length as the original multi-track recording, and I'll tell you why. It was mixed down to tape. So you had this digital format, right. multi-track tape format that was mixed on an SSL console and then down okay. to a, a, a half-inch tape, right? right. Okay. Half-inch tape stretches is an organic piece of yes. plastic. Right. So the, fi- the finished product that Sony has came off of that tape, and that tape is a different stretch and, and f- wow and flutter from the original recorded music. So you can't even get the original tempos off the CD. Right, right, because it's been right. altered by the tape process. So, okay, um, I dug deep into my boxes of junk and found a set of the original multi tracks that was about anywhere from sixty to seventy seven percent whole. Lots of vocals were missing, lots of guitars were missing, but what was present was the um original click track and the drums and the bass right so you had a and place. i hear that because i right. hear that i hear the dj scratch different i hear the vocals very different well so no we can't use the originals we had to okay. replace oh. them one at a time but oh, wow. that but that led us to the right place right we had a got fix it. like almost like when uh, like a it, foundation like it got you to the you remember in uh, you remember in uh a Apollo 13, when Jim Lovell has to get the earth in the in the window yes. so he can just fire yes. the engines for a little. There was a fixed right. point in space that we finally had where cool. it was like, Got oh, it. this is the kick drum sound. And that's why we did this. And that's why we did this. And that's so on. So like the target. It, get, yeah, it got so, you the target. so we began replacing the missing instruments first and then replaced the other ones retroactively. So we got the record back together in the original shape that it was in. And we were missing the click track for the song sunshine and we were also missing it for wanna be gangster but luckily my co-producer phil still had his original zip discs with the mpc <laughs> 2000 tracks on them and we were <laughs> able to at, on its last legs held together with 
popsicle sticks and glue and tape, we actually did a scuzzy zip disk transfer <laughs> to like a hundred megabytes. Oh, zip disk, right? you don't even want to know how many times we failed and started over. It was a nightmare, <laughs> but we were able to get the original tempo loops for those two songs. And the upside to that was that those were sample free samples that we used from a disc in the nineties called wall of vinyl. So that Sony couldn't claim as an original piece of the material. So we were clear on that All right. and recreated it. Now, when I say it was a forensic process, I'm describing like, I'm, I'm making this a short story. It was like Lord of the Rings. It was like, trying <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard about just the the original song and how you re-recorded it anyway. So you already went through how many, like, almost a decade's worth of journey to get to the song in the first place, right? Right, right. And you, then you have to recreate it after 30 years of being a different person? Like, good luck, Exactly, right? exactly. There yeah. was a lot of forensic... You even feel different. Yeah, tedious forensic re-examination. And then there was, like, a couple things where we were like, you know what? This snare drum is really cool for a late 90s, early 2000s record. It's got that sort of piccolo, Limp biscuit vibe, where it's or corn, where it's like real spanky. But right. I wanted something a little bit more thick and round, mm -hmm. and so we changed the and snare drum. And it is. Drum it's got sound. a little more, I don't want to say a little bass, not bass heavy, but just a little more it's warm to it. It's warmer. warmer. It's got, warmer got more Warmer for stuff. sure. It's, it's, it's And rounded. the DJ part, instead of the high, I kind of... It's funny because like you hear it and you're like, yeah. you just get it right in your head. You hear the new one and it's just different and it's just yeah. a little lower and like a slower almost. And it's probably the style of the DJing now that's different even from when it was when scratching was such a thing back then. Well, so the original we had was a guy named uh, Pippi Long Scratchings and his and his <laughs> he was a DJ and his his thing was he played his turntables through guitar pedals distortion oh, wah cool. uh he was crazy cool um very cool and so that was best recreated with uh like guitar amps inside the computer so matthew our bass player spent a ton of time rebuilding those from scratch that's um, awesome did yeah, a good job I think, he think he did really well i think it came out nice. it came out real good um so much so that when we finally put it out in april of 2020 Sony claimed it as uh, a master's copyright. They claimed it as the same thing. And we had to get our lawyer. It took about five weeks to show them wow. with a phase test that it wasn't the same thing. So they Do were. Do you mind if I ask the cost of what that would have cost you just to get through that process? Is that covered? You mean by the lawyer? Rights? Yeah, I mean, just uh, to do that. Because like, cause what we seem to find is, right, here you are, an independent artist, just putting out art putting out beautiful things and here's a company claiming your art right in a weird yeah. way yeah it's expensive um i would say that he did us a favor and it and it cost us about 15 grand just to just to get through the, the discussion um but yeah that sounds like a favor actually I, I'm but, I, but, I, but 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 i but i well because you're to got one guy it's like david versus goliath right it's one guy right talking to however many departments at the label who are responsible for enforcing their copyright. You're talking about a multinational media corporation, right? right. And he's a, he's a, and you have to make your case. He's they're a very experienced lawyer, but they already think that they're right. You know, they already think they got this locked and they're probably willing to go to court on it unless they know that they're going to lose and it's going to be a waste of time. So we had to get real tenacious and, uh, stick to our guns on it. And I actually had this, this saved the day. I had the original liner notes booklet from the sample free CD that we had gotten that intro loop off of. And it clearly says on the inside, uh, this is a uh, common use copyright, blah, 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 blah. It was all, all of what they needed to see. Right. To prove yeah, to them that that's use. not unique. Yeah. So, um, right. That was what did it. That was what tipped it over. And five weeks later, they let go of the copyright claim on YouTube and we were able to release it. So, so um, you guys broke up, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, this right? band is not. We, one thing we've never done is, is to do the wise breakup. I know there's a lot of wisdom in a, in a breakup and they, 
It always annoys me when bands, oh, this is the last time we're touring, we're breaking up, we're going home, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, of course, three years later, they're out on the reunion tour. But, um, yeah, the Eagles, actually. I saw the Eagles <laughs> recently, Hotel California, and I remember Hell Freezing Over being their reunion tour. Right. right. Their right. final. It's, from, it's from, one of those like, things the 90s. I would like. I'd like very much to avoid that in our lives. But <laughs> but anyway, the short story is... Just keep going, is, is man. That, don't, don't make any promises to stop. Just keep going. Yeah, just keep going. Um. They they let us go with it and we and we finished it. Now that now um now we have we're December first, we're dropping the entire twenty twenty reissue of the first album, which is the original ten songs that were intended, minus a little respect and punk ass bitch replaced with the B sides, Pretty Girl and I'd never write a song about you. And nice. there's also ten additional songs that we recorded during the process. That were like uh, over the years, they were tracks that I wrote that sounded too much like the first record to release because it was like, nah, shit, that's like first album stuff. We're going over again. Let's put that aside. Um, which made for a, a wonderful sort of alternate version of our first record over the years. Um, so it's a it's a double LP when I find when I finally cut the vinyl for it next year, it's going to be a double LP uh, of the first awesome. record that everybody knows. And then the alternate universe version of the first sweetest record. So very cool. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And also we felt guilty just putting out this same record again without proving that there was other stuff that could be of interest to people. So we, we felt like that was the move. And it was I'm not going to lie. It was a pain in the ass. And we'll never do anything like that again. So, you know, but hopefully, hey, it's rewarding for you, though, because it gives you that sense of completion, right? It kind of closes a loop for you. We feel like we fixed a big hole in the roof and uh, and it's solid now. So, you know, that's yeah. important. Yeah. It's important. So so you have hand uh, hand over your loved ones. Right. And then you mm -hmm. change the title. That's funny. Uh, or so or did it did it not change or did it? We did. We did. So we were in. Uh, Suck Phony was the first idea for our second major label release, and it was meant to be a live album. Why? Because we were booked to play a festival in Finland in the summer of 2001, and we were supposed to be direct support to Stone Temple Pilots and Green Day. Well, Stone Temple Pilots, another guy, Wyland, uh, R.I.P., so saw, good. I saw him a handful of times. Just absolutely ridiculous. I saw him four days before he died. I saw him play oh. in on Long Island, and he was amazing. He was. Did he? Did he go fire. back halfway through, shoot up, and come back out? Because that's I what he didn't. I didn't see him do anything like okay. that. I didn't see any yeah. behavior like that. He didn't seem high. But oh. I, you know, what do I know? But um, no, no, it doesn't. It was in Phoenix. He, what happened was he they played a solo. He slipped back and he came back out and he just saw a little different guy and it was like. Oh, yeah, buddy. sorry, sorry. That this breaks your heart, you know. Yeah, man. Anyway, I mean, what a please. talent. But um, so but anyway, Stone Temple Files, okay. Yeah, Stone Temple and Green Day, and three weeks before we were supposed to go over there and do it, the promoter called and said Green Day and Stone Temple have pulled out. Now I think that at the time it was maybe a rehab situation, and we were it was explained to us whatever I don't know, but I, I, you know what doesn't matter. Things happen. Yep, right? whatever. So. But he said, do you want to pick up the headlining slot? Because since I booked it, you guys have a, a top 10 record in in Finland. And let's, you know, why don't you fly up here and do this? I, I think you right. can headline it. Well, what he didn't tell us was that he had moved um, his marketing and just put us instead onto a, a black metal festival <laughs> in Finland, in the Arctic like black Circle. Black death metal. Like. In the, oh, yeah. Yeah, like full on like <laughs> bands that we couldn't pl play with under any circumstances, you know. So my best friend knows all the names of those bands, by the way. Yeah, they're they're amazing. I like them. I love all that <laughs> Varg Vignes or whatever. How they, 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 they burn churches and kill each other. I love the legendary <laughs> shit. That's, you know, don't forget where I came from. I know I know what I know what that stuff is, but I don't play that music. Right. And I don't claim to. So um, anyway. We get there and we realize how fucked up this is because we're going on on the at the end of a night of pure black metal. So uh, we're playing our set, doing our best, trying to be friendly. And I get hit with a half a Belgian block right in the chest. Somebody throws it at me from way back and I just boom, knock the wind out of me, 
four inches higher would have broke my jaw and all my teeth, right? It was like oh. just knock, bounce right off of my breastplate, knock the wind out of me. I step back and I'm fucking mad. I'm like, I'm like, that's a cowardly thing to do. And I, like a green first time in another country artist, New I Yorker. challenged the guy who threw it to a fist fight on stage. Like a fucking idiot, right? I would have done the same thing and it would have been the same mistake, I'm sure. Well, well, let's see. Was it a mistake? 30 let's seconds later, security, <laughs> four of them, are on a Viking who's two heads taller than me and about as wide as I am high, right? So the mountain is basically the, the coming at you. The mountain is coming down. He's got <laughs> blonde hair down to here. He's built like <laughs> Thor. He's fucking drunker than, like, human beings can actually get because, obviously, he's a Norse god. So, uh, And, like... <laughs> He's ready to fucking kill me. And I mean, kill me. It was over, right? So he gets up to the front and he's screaming, suck, you suck, phony, you suck. That's his only English, right? You so suck, phony. That's all he can say in English is you suck, phony. So I get off the stage and I go to our monitor guy. I'm like, did you record that show on a dat? And he's like, yes. I was like, did you get the fucking, was it rolling when the guy came up? Because I, I know I could hear him in my in-ear, so he's on tape. And he goes, yeah. And I was like, we are putting this out as a live record and we're calling it Suck Phony. Oh, that's great. That's where that came from. And oh, then later awesome. it evolved into let's retitle the second album. When the when Sony refused to release the second album, we thought, OK, well, let's repurpose that title because now it makes more sense like this. So, right. Um, I just that was the original intention anyway. So but that's Hand Up Your Loved Ones was was always the real title for it. The Suck Phony idea, that was fun for a little while. But the. But the real the real album was handle hand over your loved ones, and I'm still very proud of that record. It's it's uh, it's I think it's our best sounding vinyl cut uh, because it came off of a one inch tape reel. Um, it has my favorite three songs in a row. It's which got, are uh, anyway, okay, freak on, and lemonade. I don't know right. why, but something about I think it's that order. Yeah, that is mistaken. it. Yeah, yeah. And it's just um, something about it. Like I literally go on a walk and I can just loop those three and it's just, they give you a different vibe. Each song's different. And like, I, I think I mentioned, I think I tweeted even or some X posted, whatever. Um, something about like, anyway, is almost like after the breakup between Noel. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, I was, I was really, really trying hard to avoid anything that was teenage dirt bag ish. I also wanted to stretch our legs a little bit on arrangement and get, uh, instead of a double guitar sound, I wanted to get a keyboard sound and a guitar that was more like what Deep Purple does than, than just, you know, just repeat the same formula from album one. Um, oh, and it sounds I, totally different. And your harmonies are phenomenal. And like there are so many places that I hear on like for specifically anyway that you can throw so many of these extra harmonies in there that I'm like hearing them in my head because it's yeah. like one of those songs that like it's like a live yeah, you know, it's like always constantly. Changing. I wrote I wrote that song sitting on a toilet in France. In a... <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel great about. Great, I picked the most sophisticated song. You're taking a shit, and uh, that's my. Hey, look, song. man, taking a shit can have the thoughts can it's be true. real. You you know you know flow the flow. You, know, you really finally get some quiet, some peace and quiet. But um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean that was and that was how it was then. We were doing so much press and. Uh, and festivals and shit that the only quiet time was on the toilet. So I was always bringing my guitar into the toilet with me, you know? Um, right. but, uh, the, uh, yeah, that's, that's where that came from. And also that, that feeling of like, uh, a bunch of different vibes on the same record that are glued together by this sort of like, uh, it's pop, but it's gnarly enough to be like, you know, a piece of candy in a poison wrapper kind of thing. Like it's like it's like you you want another one, but you're not sure you want to take the first bite. Kind of that's how I wanted it. Um, right. So it is a caught is a bit of a caustic record at times. It's sort of sh sh shreddy, I guess you could call it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's still thumping. The guy who mixed uh, the most recent Beatles record mixed it. A guy named Spike Stent. He did. Uh, oh, cool. He's he's famous for uh, mixing um, most of the Madonna catalog. And okay. um, and a lot of other great great records, but um, uh, but most recently, yeah, and like I I I love that bass on Freak On. It's just one of those songs where it changes tempos. I like. There's a couple songs that like when I'm 64, right? It changes. Yeah. And uh, scenes from an Italian restaurant, Billy Joel, changes. 
You yeah. know what I mean? And I get that kind of vibe from it, but it it trans smooth. The transitions are still smooth, and it's yeah, not cinematic. Cinematic. I want, yeah, I, I wanted a I wanted it to have a dance Motown pulse and still be cinematic in its scenery, right? It was like change yeah. change the room every once in a while, but you still feel the beat. And that's what it was. That's what I get from that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that, man. Thank, thanks. I, you know, that record I, went. I, I, I love was, music, but I'm not good with the verbiage. So, like, I I try to use English layman terms for no, you're good. Feelings you're, that you you're, probably are. You're making perfect about, sense so. to me, man. You, I, I get it. Um, <laughs> that's all that matters. I hope that yeah. matters. So. <laughs> that record was real obscure. They only put out a, a thousand copies of that somewhere in the UK, and the American wow. label didn't even put it out. So it was. That's uh, crazy. It was. Uh, it, it got. It got a, a almost no release. Um, have you found it in any of the the stores in the UK? Yeah, like I see I see CDs sometimes on the used rack in the, in the UK. Yeah. Um, kids send me pictures of them when they find it. You know, it's like a a, a, a like piece a of gold rod. to them. Yeah, yeah. But um, <laughs> but we reissued it um on vinyl, and the the vinyl cut is just is the definitive. You know, my friend Paul, uh, Gold at Salt Mastering, he did a, a direct transfer off a t- off a oh, one inch tape. And it's it's as analog as it gets. It was slamming, you know. It's really vinyl and so important. Analog yeah. is just such a different feel to it. The so, warmth, you get that. Yeah, it's thumping. About. That that vinyl is thumping. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's cool. Cool. Well, I'm so glad you spent you shared your time with me. I, I I could talk for hours. So if you if there's anything else you want to share, if you want to share any stories about your trip or any. You know, oh, whatever man, you just, want to talk uh, about, man. I'm... Well, we got we got Christmas dirt bag just dropped today. I don't know if you saw the video for that. Um, I did not see the video, but I listened to it a couple times on Spotify already. So yeah, excellent. Uh, that was fun. My my partner Gabrielle wrote those lyrics. I was at a loss. I had no I no no way to go because it's just been teenage dirt bag for me for so many years. I just I I couldn't even have an imagination about something else. But she did it to the point where I can still remember how it goes, which is a feat. But um. Uh, and then I'm, 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 uh, like I said, we're dropping the whole entire re-release of, uh, album one on December 1st, uh, all on streaming. And, um, in addition to that, we are, uh, hitting the road with, um, I'm hitting the road with Art Alexakis from Everclear. We're doing a little, uh, Australian acoustic tour together. Uh, he's one of my favorite songwriters. So that's going to be like going back to school, as I said, you know, um, you know Everclear well, yeah. Yeah, man, so awesome. Uh, and uh, and then there's a bunch of touring on on the burner for next year that I'm not allowed to talk about quite yet. But I'm I I keep getting surprised by uh, people wanting us to come out and do our show. So uh, we will be there with bells on uh, anytime we get invited to go do these shows. So I'm I, you know it's it's like you know, like I said, living the dream kind of still you know. Um, but uh. In addition to that, there's a movie uh, that a couple of guys in the UK are making about us called You Might Die. Uh, in particular, it was filmed during the toughest years on the road, 2010, 2011, 2012, when it was really touch and go, when we weren't sure if it was going to happen again next year kind of thing. And I, mean, I saw an article I mean, from 2017 yeah, that said something and, about shutting it down. Yeah, they've just been today. Yeah, they've been they've been they've been doing this uh for us for a long time and there was like i mean this band was hanging by a thread financially from about 2006 through to 2017 2016 oh when we started to see some of the one direction royalties coming it's a in tough that, 10 year stint though y- yeah that's, man it was raw that's I a mean, long you know, time yeah. it was a long time it was a long time saying to the band uh, we got to take six months off. I'm not sure about when we're coming back, you know, that kind of thing. And, and Matthew and the other guys we've worked with over the years were patient enough, uh, to wait and improvise their own financial lives until this became a thing that was not as touch and go. And we're kind of emerging from that period now with all that's going on. Um, we're learning how to be a band that's not living on the edge of the cliff, you know, which is new and we're not getting that one right yet, but, but I'll let you know, you know, this transition to the online stuff. I saw you do like an online cover thing. You did like a Q and a, I thought that was really good. Did you get a lot of reception from that or, uh, I'm not sure which one you're, you're talking about, but, um, but it was uh, probably during COVID. I think you guys had just, uh, just literally just like had a Q and a after doing maybe 10 or 15 songs, like, yeah. 
Um, a cover song. I know. Uh, hit me with your best shot was. One oh of yeah, them. yeah, yeah. I think I think I know what you're talking about. You're talking about yeah. our, our just, little. Web you know, like I said, like you go down the rabbit hole. I like type in. I literally type in Weedus and boom, you're just. There's yeah. just plenty of stuff to sift through. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think I think we're I think we're uh, beginning to focus more and more on just being as good as we can be at the music. We we do all request sets live. We don't make a set list. So if you're at our show, you get to call out whatever you want to hear. And it, you what know, an interesting niche, like yeah, a niche niche market. Focus on your music as a musician. Imagine that. <laughs> Like, uh, <laughs> <That's it. laughs> um, and man, you, you've got some crazy tempos on some of those double beats that you, there's a new song that you have with the, du- and I heard you play it on tiny desk and it's just like, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, I think on. you're talking about lullaby. L- yes. L- lullaby was, I said to myself during the, during the winter of, uh, 2015, I said, you know, somewhere over the rainbow that's jazz, but that used to be pop, right? That was what was popular music. Right. And that's a country was pop back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that is a complicated arrangement. Can you write anything that complicated that fits within the three minute and a half, you know, moment and is also accessible from a vocal? Can you sing along to it? And so right. that was lullaby was that experiment for me. Um, yeah. It's yeah, cool that you get to do those experiments and get to play around and some things take and you never know. Which exactly that. Gonna... I mean, if we were still on a major label or if, or if uh, we got a second chance at a, at a good second record being released and all that stuff, I don't know if we would have been able to make a song like Lullaby. Like that's that would have been too far afield for for our partners, you know. But yeah. as it stands, we've been free of management and record label since 2005. So we that that's a feat in itself, though. I mean. It's, it's weird. It's weird. Up but against the big boys all the time. Yeah, man. I mean, tiny fish in a big pond all all the time. You know, that's that's our that's our career. You know. Excellent. So. Well, I'm I'm so grateful for your time. Uh, if there's ever any time you want to come back on again, if you're ever in town in Phoenix, please reach out. We definitely you know, love man, to definitely love to have uh, you come over. And... I'm going to be doing. It's not announced yet, but I'm going to be doing a lot of acoustic solo touring in 2024. It's it's a lower 48. So we're getting that's them my all. Favorite kind. Yeah. Okay. Gonna yeah. do them all. I'm a big I'm a big fan of like Edwin McCain. David David Ryan Harris is my absolute favorite singer. Yeah, uh, he's part with the John Mayer trio, you know, and yeah, just some of yeah. these guys just uh, the acoustic stuff's where it's at. You know, I'm so. looking forward to the to the woodshedding because when you go out there by yourself, you got to relearn the song in a way where you're not leaning back on your band and all of the tricks and bells and whistles. So it's back to basics. It is and, pure. It is yeah. just a pure. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like the cover band thing. It's like if you can't recognize the song, you oh, yeah. can't be a cover band. You just, no, you're you right. just can't be a cover band. And when you're an acoustic, I see acoustic cover guys, you know, doing doing uh, oh, yeah. coffee house gigs, and I'm like, man, that's some brave shit. Because if you fuck walk, up, yep. yeah, <laughs> it's they on loop you. it. They loop the stuff with their pedals and stuff, and they've got <laughs> some drill like they're playing on the back of their. Dr- it's amazing some of the stuff. Like Ed Sheeran's really good with the looping and stuff. Like yeah, how he. How he holds that in you know, we were so. in we were in ireland about a month ago and we were uh we were walking past the the venue next to us after we loaded out and there's this guy in there and he's doing ariana grande and he's doing uh just you name it michael buble songs and like the whole entire pop canon and he's his voice is just perfect and he's killing it and he's playing along on the guitar and he's great and i thought to myself i ain't that good like right. I, I can't do that. I can't well, it's like do a it different th- skill though. Cause like you have the originality, right? Like there, once again, it's like one of those things where it's like, can you copy something really well or just emulate it very well, still make it sound great and be that technical. Or can you be original and make something new? You know, it's, I don't know. All I know is I have a lot of respect right. for guys who can, who can really I, nail somebody else's yeah. tune, you know, like that's, uh, I agree. People, people, I, people. I think it does take a lot of skill. I just coming from that side. I don't like, I like to have a little more humility about it too. Cause it's like, I didn't write the fucking thing. So how right. the hell can <laughs> right. I, like, right. well, you know, what good is me singing that damn thing? If I can't, if I didn't write it, you know, like right. one of my favorite acoustic songs in your eyes, the Peter Gabriel oh, version, uh, Jeffrey Gaines version. And I oh, got to Jeffrey sing. Jeffrey Gaines is a genius. I got uh, to sing with him on stage. Whoa! He uh, it was it was at the Tin Angel in Philadelphia. I don't know if you ever heard of the Tin Angel. It was no. a, above a restaurant called the Serrano, and it only sat 110 people. And it was like you know WPIX, whatever that uh, U Penn radio yeah. station is, that yeah. independent radio station. It was yeah. like the 10th anniversary. Jeffrey Gaines was there, 
And David David Ryan Harris opened for him, and I heard his voice and melted. Yeah, never heard it before. Jeffrey and then Gaines Jeffrey like, Gaines, he's one of them like underrated gems of American music. Man, he is like Martin Sexton. Always like, be. Yeah, it's just a powerful song. So Real he goes, good. "Hey, does anybody want to come up?" And I used to I sang it in my cover band. So I'm like, "I'll do it." And Gen- like genuine he- entertainer. I saw him do a show at Irving Plaza, and he was the first act on. Uh, for a big night and it, i think he's maybe he maybe got 120 maybe 150 tops people who had filled in already and i thought oh man this is going to be awkward nope he came out there like that was the biggest best crowd he'd ever seen and he made us all feel like we were watching something that we should have paid a lot more money for like and it yeah. was it was a good lesson and he was just chewing gum and just playing his guitar and he was perfect and his pitch he was, was perfect. Yeah. He's just like, and the lights went off and malfunctioned at one point. He made a joke about <laughs> like, it was just like, it's like, who is this guy, man? Cause I suck compared to him. Like <laughs> straight suck. Right. Um, well, it's crazy. Cause like these stories of how the connections are between artists too, is Edwin McCain tells a story about his song, beautiful life. Well, he said he was picking up Jeffrey Gaines at the airport when he drove by a strip bar. That was serving breakfast and it like gave him the inspiration for his song. It's like all you guys are connected in these crazy ships in the night kind of way, but also universally connected from the, like, I see you a lot of tweets with like Eve six, for example, which was like one that I did. I did inside out like crazy used to change the lyrics up and do have fun stuff. One of my favorite covers is their cover of the divinals. I touch myself. Oh God. Yeah. Absolute fate. I hear that, that live recording. Yeah. And it is the most absolute perfect cover of a song. And it's just an acoustic guitar in him, you know? You know, Max cool. Max talks about, he he's very self-deprecating, but I've been on tour with that band. I know that they're, the, that they're really good. They're they really been, good. Wasn't he like 16, 17 when this whole oh, thing? Oh, yeah, like, they were kids. They were like little kids when, when right. it all happened. Um, you know, in some sense, it's a miracle that they're still alive and and... Because yeah. that that L.A. music industry does not treat teenagers very well. And, and I, I, you know, I feel like uh, Eve Six is kind of an American treasure in like ways that people don't really fully understand yet, you know. Um, but uh, I would I would kill to get out on the road with those guys again. That would be really wonderful. That would be great. We we have talked about it, but um, it's got a, a lot, of, lot of a lot of a lot of sticks have to get tossed into the fire before we can actually pull it off, you know. We're going to have to have an early 2000s type show because like my my cover band days were like 98 to 2002. So Dirtbag wouldn't have been in the repertoire yet because I went from sure. plugged into acoustic. Right. Uh, well, do, know, do us acoustic. all a favor and examine the standpoint of. From that period. 99 to 2007. Right. That's not even that's 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 not even 10 years. Right. That period of time is the most transitional upheaval of media and music that has ever happened, right? It, since is maybe that the, even worse than the disco of the of the early, late seventy early eighties? Way, way more, way misstepped? more, way more, way more. No, really? you had you had wow. formats change over. You had oh, digital, Napster was stealing music. Right, I mean, record labels you, yeah, finally had, okay. realized that well, they too late that they were selling software and the cat was out of the bag. Just. And if you were a band back then, if you were an artist, you really, in order to survive, you really had to have a healthy sense of skepticism because nobody knew what the fuck they were talking about at all. Everybody had a lot of ideas about what was going to happen. None of them were right. None of them were right. And, you know, examine that. Ask, ask, ask 90s, ask late 90s, early 2000s bands about the shit that they heard that was supposed to happen that, that didn't, you know. Have you thought about a do- maybe a documentary about that? Maybe we maybe... somebody's got to tell that story eventually because is it, it worth is it? So profound, I think it is because you I'll know. Have to look into that. Yeah, like you, you, the restructuring is, you know, it's like the financial crisis hit the music industry eight years early. You know, it's true. What it's was like, it really the shrinkage of the all the big ones eating up the small ones? Basically, it was Is that, that it was a, it was exactly that it was a, it was they came they became monopolistic. The 1996 communications bill allowed them to consolidate uh, too many different aspects of the business under one roof. 
So you had monopolies that were nationwide. And if an artist trashed a dressing room in in uh, Ohio, they got banned from clubs in in San Diego. And, and it was just it was wild what was going on back then. And I got a title the day the music almost died. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 there you it go. basically it had it had to die. They were charging they were charging twenty seven dollars for a CD that had nine songs on it. Right. right. Like, right. It was another world that no longer exists. And I was being told in no uncertain terms in 2005 that CDs are where it's at, that this digital thing is temporary, that it's going to blow over. Trust me, people are going to be buying physical music again. And I was like, no, they're not, man. No, they're not. It's fucking over. This is software we're selling, not physical stuff. Vinyl, another story. That's not what I'm talking about. Well, that, that's a, like aficionado. That's a, a total, different, a different total, experience. But that's audiophile but, stuff. That's yeah, different. but like, I mean, the the just the it was so crazy. The bullshit that got spewed during those years, because we were on Sony until 2003, and in 2007 we opened our TuneCore account and started distributing our music directly to the streaming services. You realize how short a period of time that is? Yes. That's nothing. Like, right. like so, so like it, it is profound. And, and our, our deal with Sony was a six album deal. Wow. That, that we got out of. It would have taken us past the year that we were able to start distributing ourselves. Think about that right. for a second. Oh my God. Yeah. You would have just been stuck in some, we would have been stuck in a major label that had loop. crumbled. Yeah. 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 My gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's amazing what, what online stuff did. Cause it almost crumbled it in like stealing music. Right. Like, right. Also created all these new creators of music. So yeah. It's like coming out of it. It's amazing. But that transition, it's always the transition to the new thing it's always the problem right yeah that's where the it's bullshit the, is the high, bullshit and potential is the highest during the transition yeah, there you go yeah there you go. cool yeah. well thank you again for your time man is is there anything else you wanted to share or no man i i appreciate you having me on you know thank you so much i i this was really fun i i got to yap and like I've never yapped before, and I, I, I really appreciate knowing you and talking to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Absolutely, I, I appreciate your time, Brendan. If you ever want to talk, this is this is a place, man. I'm I I allow everyone to speak their mind because I don't need to believe in what you believe in to believe in you. Yeah, that's, whatever. That's man. what it's about, I mean, right? You know, yeah. If you want to do something that's more song specific, I'll grab a guitar next time and we'll go through some oh. how how things work on on the songs and shit. You know, if you want to get into that, that's. I, I would love that. And the thing is, I, I just want to get to know you because we've never met. You were just so gracious with your time. So thank you so much for this. Yeah, man. No worries. Well, listen, you have a wonderful holiday and and uh, and we'll see you again, I hope, really soon. Yeah. Yes. Good luck. Much success with uh, everything with uh, Dirtbag. Is it Christmas Dirtbag? Christmas Dirtbag. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. If, if I may just end on a story, it's funny because Dirtbag comes out and my best friend I met in 1992, 93. Mm hmm. And his name's Chris. He, if you look at previous podcast episodes, he's my co-host on most of those previous podcast episodes. Mm -hmm. And he literally follows it, Iron Maiden everywhere. He goes on tour with them. He goes, he's gone to the last 10 shows this year. He went last year. And it's funny when that song came out and I, you don't hear it. And then you hear, I got two tickets to Iron Maiden. And it just, it like, for me personally, it's that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like that for me. So that's, thank that's you so for cool. bringing please, that. Please give Chris a hug for us. <laughs> I will give real. you, I will give him a hug. He's still around. So uh, I will give him a hug, but it's because of that, like that connection of music where I don't listen to AC, uh, I, ACDC, Iron Maiden. I don't listen to that, but my best friend does. And it's like, you're connecting that. And it makes me think of him every time I hear the song and it's played a lot. So thank you so much for bringing that to my life. Yeah, no worries, man. We appreciate it. We'll, awesome. we'll see you again. One, two, three, four. Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. I hate to leave you, but I really must say good 
night, sweetheart, good night.